is called God's Angry Man. This is fascinating today as we look at the judgment of the Almighty. We'll talk about that and more still to come. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hembry. And I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery TV, taking you from Genesis to Revelation in one year through the Bible. Corey is here. Corey, what's up? Looking at King Uzziah today as he's mentioned in our scripture reading. Excellent. And what'd you do, Jen? Excerpts from letters from viewers. Excellent. Very good. Look forward to that. Also, Ryan is here. Ryan, what's up? Well, in the book of Amos, God declares judgment on several nations, two of which were Ammon and Moab. But who were these people? You know, this is a very interesting day. All of these things are coming your way as we continue to study God's word. Amos is amazing. I want to tell you, I call him God's righteous prophet, but that's another story for another day. Let's study the book of Amos. Amos chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. The words of Amos, who was among the sheep breeders of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. And he said, The Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherds mourn and the top of Carmel withers. Thus says the Lord, For three transgressions of Damascus and for four, I will not turn away its punishment, because they have threshed Gilead with implements of iron. But I will send a fire into the house of Haziel, which shall devour the palaces of Ben-Hadad. I will also break the gate bar of Damascus and cut off the inhabitant from the valley of Avon and the one who holds the scepter from Beth Eden. The people of Syria shall go captive to Ker, says the Lord. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Gaza and for four, I will not turn away its punishment because they took captive the whole captivity to deliver them up to Edom but I will send a fire upon the wall of Gaza, which shall devour its palaces. I will cut off the inhabitant from Ashdod and the one who holds the scepter from Ashkelon. I will turn my hand against Ekron and the remnant of the Philistines shall perish, says the Lord God. Amos chapter one, verses one through eight. One of the most passionate prophets in the Bible. This is the great guy. Well, he did not come from a priestly. He did not come from a prophetic family. His name was Amos. Amos! And he was a sheep herder and tree farmer from Tekoa in Judah. And he was called by God and began to speak for the Lord around 760 BC. Can you believe that? I believe his writings are one of the best ever published as you begin to study them. I mean, Amos uses dramatic Hebrew number parallelisms in poetry and directly confronts the people of Israel during that time. He's amazing. He's often called God's angry man because of his anger and it's evident through his words. But from a theological point of view, he is called the prophet of righteousness, the prophet of of rightness with God. I want to tell you, this man is absolutely amazing. He's stunning. And uh, Amos is great because this particular passage today, again, we are talking a lot about judgment. And the Bible says, you know, don't judge each other. They're not judging. These are God's word talking about judgment. And the people he's speaking about are his own people. So we need to understand that judgment on the nations. God speaks to the nations. Now, remember, Amos 1, 1 through 8 is where we're at. Take your Bible guide, because as you go to it, you begin to learn something interesting. And uh, Amos is a man who we need to pay attention to because he's called by God to deliver a message to all of the people around, not just Israel, not just Judah, but all of the people around. That is the nations around them. We need to understand that. 
And so as we think that through and turn your Bible guide to today's passage, if you don't have a Bible guide, why not? You can write for yours today at the address at the bottom of the screen, or you can go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com. And my suggestion would be make a donation in any amount. And that page after the donation will take you to a PDF file. And you can also order your guide as well. And uh, it'll, it'll be the pocket guide. You can get it instantaneously or however long it takes you to make a donation. That's great. And you can also make a donation and not get a guide if you don't want to. You can get the PDF guide because that's very important. Father, I pray today in the name of Jesus Christ. Amos was your man for the time. And he's your man for the time now because your words are true for every single generation. Your words speak to every single generation. Young, old, medium, in between, doesn't matter. God, I pray that your word would penetrate our hearts, that we would learn from it in the name of Jesus Christ. And we all said together, amen. Listen to Amos. This is Amos 1, verse 1. Listen carefully. The words of Amos, who was among the sheep breeders of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, the king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the sons of Joash, king of Israel, two years, look at this, two years before the earthquake. Really? That's amazing. See, the prophecies of Amos are clearly highlighted, and God has marked all of time with what we do and how we do it. God is a keeper of time. He created time and time is in his hand and he keeps it. So our time doesn't just happen over here. You know, father time or time does this and we just kind of go along and we guess along our way and make our free choices. That's not exactly how it works. God is the creator of time. He is the ender of time, end of time. And beloved, we need to understand that we make choices. God has given us the right to make choices. God knows the choices we're going to make. Isn't that something? When you pray to God, you pray to a God who sees your birth and your death in this life at the same time. Isn't that amazing? And all the stages in between. So God knows, beloved. God understands. We need to get it in our hearts and our minds that, Lord, we see that when we pray to you, we're praying to somebody who is vastly charged with a divine mind. See, a lot of people don't. They pray to a, a God, a God. But we pray to God Almighty. That is the, the everlasting God who's God over the universe, God over the earth, the God of all people. That's who God is. And Amos continues to speak. We're only, got, we're only one verse in. God continues to speak through Amos, and here's what he says. He says, and he said, the Lord roars from Zion. <laughs> you know, the Lord roars. That's, that's important because God is speaking loudly. And he utters his voice from Jerusalem. He roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherds mourn. And the top of Carmel withers. That is intense. Beloved, God chooses where and when to speak. And we should be ready to listen to God at all times. Many people say, well, I've prayed to God and he never answers me. When God has answered you hundreds of times, but you're not listening to him. Now, how many of us could say that? God has answered me hundreds of times, but I haven't listened to him. Not exactly nice to say, but if you got quiet in your own time with God, you could say, Lord, forgive me for not hearing you and not listening to you. Very important, beloved. We need to listen to God. Now, God can speak loudly. Don't worry. And God will speak loudly. There's coming a time when God will speak very loudly. But we need to tune our spirits. Tune our spirits to the sensitivity of God very important. So Lord, help us to do that today. Now, we go on to three through eight. Listen carefully. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Damascus and for four, I will not turn away its punishment because they have threshed Gilead with implements of iron. But I will send fire into the house of Hazel 
which shall devour the palaces of Ben-Hadad. I will also break the gate bar of Damascus and cut off the inhabitant from the valley of Avon and the one who holds the scepter from Beth Eden. The people of Syria shall go captive to curse, says the Lord. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Gaza and four, I will not turn away its punishment because they took captive the whole captivity to deliver them up to Edom. But I will send a fire upon the wall of Gaza, which shall devour its palaces. I will cut off the inhabitant from Ashdod and the one who holds the scepter from Ashkelon. I will turn my hand against Ekron and the remnant of the Philistine shall perish, says the Lord God. Wow, unbelievable numbers and poetry there. God does not ignore anything, anything. You see, God's memory is perfect. Perfect, his memory is perfect, beloved. We think, oh, well, that happened 20 years ago. I didn't even remember it, but God does. And when we come to the Lord Jesus Christ and ask him to forgive us of all things, whatever, whenever we remember things, we need to say, Lord, forgive me of that. I didn't need to do that. And if we need to tell people, forgive me or ask people to forgive you, then we do that. But beloved, we must understand that God's divine mind has perfect memory, which is why we ask Jesus Christ to come into our heart and cleanse us and keep us from all evil. Very important. This passage of scripture is so important that we pray, Lord, teach me to be careful with my words and my actions I've learned in Amos on this day. We are beginning another new book of the Old Testament today, the book of the prophet Amos. Now, Amos uh, lets us know, uh, you know, what time in history, in Judah's history that he is prophesying. He's prophesying during uh, the reign of King Uzziah. Now, this is interesting. If you've been paying attention as we've been going through uh, these prophets, you'll notice that there was quite a bit of prophetic activity around the days of King Uzziah. Now, this is because there was a lot of power Power transfers. I believe this is because I should say there was a lot of political power transfers going on. And so God's plan for the nation of Israel and the nation of Judah was moving forward. And it was dependent on the reaction of the people of Israel and Judah. So because of that, there's a lot of prophets in here, prophets of God who are speaking the words of the people and trying to get them to go along with God's plan, uh, you know, or face the consequences. Because we have to remember they were a covenant people of God, which means they agreed to go into a national relationship with God. This is a little bit different than a personal relationship, but we can talk about that after. First, let's take a look at this reign of King Uzziah, because it was definitely an interesting one. King Uzziah is called by two names in the Bible, Azariah in 2 Kings and Uzziah in 2 Chronicles. Uzziah began his reign when he was 16 years old and managed to keep the throne until his death 52 years later. This was in breaking with recent family tradition. Both his father Amaziah and his grandfather Jehoash were murdered by some of their own officials. Uzziah ruled Judah and Jerusalem in a sort of golden age of peace for the area. Both Judah and northern Israel benefited from the empire of Assyria being preoccupied with other nations to the north of them. Israel and Judah were also at a temporary peace with one another, and so King Uzziah had much time to expand his nation. The Bible gives him credit for great warfare, taking and rebuilding Eloth in the territory of Edom taking three Philistinian cities and building his own cities in their territories, and turning the Ammonite people into vassals of Judah. 
Credit is also given him for being industrious. He built fortified towers on the walls of Jerusalem, built military towers in the desert, and made use of war machines said to be placed in the towers to shoot arrows and large stones. Uzziah also reorganized Judah's military and supplied them with armor and equipment. Apart from military concerns, King Uzziah is said to have loved the soil, commissioning farmers and vine dressers in the mountainous areas of Judah and digging many new wells for his large amounts of herd animals. All of this taken together apparently made him famous as far as the entrance to Egypt, for he became exceedingly strong. While it was this strength that would corrupt Uzziah's motivations, his life has left an archaeological record. Seal impressions that mention him by name have been found. They originally belonged to two of his court officials. A gravestone warning people of Uzziah's leprosy has also been found. Though dated to a later time than his, it's believed that his bones were moved from his original tomb, and the ominous gravestone marked their new resting place. So King Uzziah, what an interesting guy who was alive in this time period that allowed him to have as many interests as he did. So I talked a little bit uh, earlier about God's timing in this, and it's interesting to think about uh, and fun to guess, you know, and, and it really is a guess. I, I'm, you do have to make some assumptions here. You have to be, it's a little bit of a puzzle putting together uh, some, of the, some of the plan of God here. We see where it went. Uh, you know, it went to ultimately the, the punishment, the destruction of uh, the northern kingdom of Israel, though their capital city of Samaria survived, uh, and the destruction of Judah and the capital city of Jerusalem that was actually destroyed and later rebuilt by the exiles. And this destruction over and over and over and over again in the Old Testament is because of the rebelliousness and the continued rebelliousness of the people, despite uh, God giving them, uh, you know, a lifeline. This is your time to repent. Now is your time to repent over and over and over. And they said no, and they rejected it. Um, so we see where this went. So at this time period of Uzziah, you know, and continuing to Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, this was a time of decision uh, for the people of Judah and for the leadership of Judah, which is why we see so much prophetic activity. Anyway, I'm going to pass it over to Ryan now. Ryan, what do you have for us? Thanks, Corey. Well, today our reading is Amos chapters 1 to 4, which, of course, is the entire book. And in it, we read God's declarations of judgment on several nations. Two in particular were Ammon and Moab. But just who were these people? Well, it all goes back to a man named Lot. Let's study. His name was Lot. He was the son of Abraham's brother, Haran who were the sons of Terah. So Lot was Abraham's nephew. And this would later prove to be an important connection for Lot, since his father Haran died prematurely. Thus Abraham apparently took Lot under his wing, a good match since Lot had no father and Abraham and his wife Sarah had no children. Lot journeyed with his uncle for quite some time. By the time that they came to rest in Canaan, Lot and Abraham were so prosperous that the land could no longer support them both. Indeed, as nomads, they lived on the outskirts of the city, and with the Canaanites and Perizzites dwelling in the land, there was limited space for their flocks and herds. So Abraham asks Lot to separate from him, and even offers him the first choice of the land. When Lot looks off to the east, he sees the richly luscious and very well-watered plain of the Jordan. It seemed to be the prime choice. However, what Lot seems to have not realized is that the people there were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. So while Abraham remained in Canaan, Lot moved eastward and dwelt in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. For now, Lot would continue in his nomadic lifestyle, but eventually he would move into the city and even become a citizen and elder of Sodom, one who sat at the gate of the city. In fact, on one particular evening, while Lot was sitting at this gate, he sees two men approaching the city. Knowing just how dangerous the streets of Sodom are, Lot offers them lodging. There they feast and have fellowship, but before bedtime all the men of Sodom surrounded Lot's house and demanded that he bring out the two men so that they can have homosexual relations with them. Word of these two men had spread fast. At this point, Lot goes out to plead with them not to commit this horrendous act, 
and even goes so far as to offer them his own two virgin daughters. But they only got more violent. With Lot now in extreme danger, the two men pull him back into the house, shut the door, and eliminate the threat by striking the surrounding mob with blindness and confusion. Though up to this point, Lot seemingly did not know that he had been entertaining angels, their identity and the purpose of their visit was now made known. With the destruction of the city imminent, Lot attempts to warn his other family members, but they do not believe him. In the end, Lot escaped with his two daughters, but his wife was lost when she lingered to look at the destruction and perhaps got caught in the superheated spray of minerals. She became a pillar of salt. His two daughters would later get him drunk and each become pregnant by him in order to preserve their family line. So as Genesis 19 explains, Lot's older daughter bore him a son who she called Moab, who became the father of the Moabites, while Lot's younger daughter bore him a son named Ben-Ami, who became the father of the Ammonites. So here we see how the nations of Ammon and Moab began. It wasn't a good beginning, and it wouldn't be a good end either. But it wasn't all bad. Remember Ruth? She was a Moabite, but she had the honor of actually being a part of Jesus Christ's messianic line. You can actually read Matthew 1 for the specifics, and in a couple of weeks when we get into Matthew, you and I are actually going to trace the women mentioned in Jesus' family tree. The background of these mothers of Messiah may surprise you. And I also actually wrote about it in this month's Discovery Guide. So if you want to preview it, you can check it out. You know, the background of those women and uh, the genealogy of Jesus Christ is fascinating because, you, you know, you've got Moabites mm -hmm. and you've got Rahab and you've got all these... I mean, these are not, I mean, I mean they, they don't have the reputation and the, but they're, they're ordinary women. Yeah. But you know what? They did it right. I mean, everyone yeah. made a decision. And you know, actually who did a great teaching on this was Jim Canelon. Um, he does a really good presentation of this particular, uh, these mothers of Messiah. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can actually get that in his uh, casual commentary. So. And Jim Canelon, is that the program we do here yeah. uh, at this, at this uh, ministry? And Jim is also now at the on the NRB on the, I think it is Sunday nights, mm -hmm. and uh, so it's all, he's also on Vision Television as well. So uh, Vision Television in Canada across the nation and all, NRB across the nation. So that's really good. We're very excited about that too. But these women were interesting people because they made decisions, and when you make a decision, you know they they go for it. And I, I find that fascinating. And also, I, I need to tell you, I'm just totally taken by Amos. I love this guy. Mm -hmm. This guy, I mean, he, he, is, he rocks my boat. He really is. <laughs> People call him God's angry man. I don't. I call him God's man of righteousness because he is so expressive. His beautiful writing in Hebrew is outstanding. The, the way the poetry is put together with the numbers and everything else, I looked at it. It is amazing writing, I want to tell you. It's, it's excellent. So we got another day in Amos, and it's good, a good day. So anyway. Uh, I think it was back in the 80s. Remember I used to sing a song called Ordinary People? Yeah. God uses ordinary people. That's been going through my mind as we've been sitting here talking, because he does. We're all just people that God has designed, and, and we all have a purpose, a unique you know, Ryan was talking about his new little son, Elias, and, and how you were sitting and talking with him the other night, mm -hmm. just you and him, and you were telling him how that he was so special and uniquely designed by God. Yeah. And it's so true. Yeah. You, it's it, so true. Absolutely. You got to speak truth even over the little children. You, you absolutely know? do. Mm -hmm. yes. I, I remember Ryan saying to me that you can't go back in time. You have to go forward in time. And he realized that. And uh, it's true because God has, has us uh, in time going a certain way. Yeah. And uh, so time is very important. And the, that's the important thing I wanted to mention here. Amos is in time. And we see him, we go back and we read about it and his words are just as relevant today as they ever were. Mm -hmm. So there you go. Anyway, go ahead. We're listening to your words and we love to get your letters, your testimonies, your answers to prayer for sure. And uh, I've got a few here. This one is from Bertha. She says, um, I recently started watching Quick Study and even though I'm not an early riser, nor am I, <laughs> I tape the study every day and watch it later. Um, I have just in the past year started reading the Bible daily. Good for you. Quick Study helps me a great deal. I would like to have the Bible guide. 
It's great to see your family doing this together every day. And I'm sure it will encourage other families to pray together. God bless you all. I'm so happy to have found you and have been letting everyone know about Quick Study, even my sister, sisters in the UK. Thank you for doing that. Here's another note. Thank you for your program. I love watching the family all involved in the ministry. God bless and keep doing what you are doing. I've been watching you all since Rod's dad used to have the program. God's blessing and I thank God for you. For your, for your show. Love and blessing to you all. Thank you very much. Here's another excerpt. I'm so richly blessed by your Bible discovery program, Colleen writes. The word of God is powerful, and I'm deeply aware that you and yours preach the word in spirit and truth. It was the word that convicted me of sin, and by acknowledging it and trusting Jesus to be my Lord and Savior, I was miraculously saved a set free and delivered from so many wicked, sinful things. So praise God. Wow, that is amazing. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you all for sharing your testimonies with us. And uh, it, it, it really is an encouragement to us here and to our staff. And, um, and, and that's just the letters. We have emails as well that come mm -hmm. in. And uh, listen, we get your emails, we get your letters, we pray over them. We have a prayer team that does that. Pray, prayer is such an important yes. part. It's Bible reading and prayer. Bible reading and prayer. That's how we focus on God. And uh, the, the one lady here who said she's not an early riser. <laughs> I get it. I understand. But at the same time, uh, when we get up and when we make sure that we, first thing we do is talk to the Lord. And uh, people do that through this program, but other people do that as well. I, I want to encourage you. When we connect with God, He connects with us. He is for those who are looking for him. And so as we look for God at the beginning of the day, he takes care of us for the rest of the day.